The wheel of the year turns. All around us new life springs to the surface. The pace of spring is quickening. The nights are drawing in. The days are drawing out. And now is the time of the ancient pagan fire festival at Beltane. Towards the end of April, our ancient ancestors used to burn bonfires across the landscape in order to drive out the dark spirits of winter. They would collect their last embers and put them into special pouches for protection throughout the year. And some souls even rose early on the morning of the spring equinox to go out into the meadows and collect the early morning dew. It was believed to have special powers and applying it to your face would bring on youthfulness. It is said that the ancient Britons reenacted the Greenwood marriage where the union of the horned god Hearn the Hunter and the goddess ensured the fertility of the land. Hearn became a great white stag, transformed into the prey he hunted, and chased the goddess, manifested as a white deer, across the land, until, upon their union, she transformed him back into his original form. This whole time is a celebration of the potency and fertility of the earth. In Lee Wood, beside the River Derwent, the valley side is carpeted in the most admired spring wildflower, the daffodil. But this is not the garden variety. These are the true native wild daffodils. Smaller, paler, daintier, and far less showy than their cultivars. It was once incredibly common throughout the country, but now has disappeared from much of its range, and just survives in isolated pockets. The daffodil's Latin name, Narcissus, refers to an ancient Greek legend. A long time ago, a young wood nymph named Echo fell in love with a young man, who was named Narcissus. He was bestowed by the gods with the gift of great beauty and eternal youth, as long as he never looked at his reflection. Totally self-absorbed, he spurned Echo, who was consumed by love until all that was left was a voice. Nemesis, the goddess of vengeance, in retribution led him to a shimmering mountain lake that mirrored his face. There, at the water's edge, he became transfixed caught in the sad spell of his own beauty. Unable to move, the gods turn Narcissus into a scented flower which droops down to admire itself in the spring waters. And if you look in its dainty cup, you can still see Narcissus's tears. A few miles east is the quaint village of Alstonfield, high on the limestone plateau, its dry stone walls snaking down to the deep valleys of the Manifold and Dove. This is the graveyard of St. Peter's Church, dating back to before the Norman invasion. It has a true botanical highlight, the Oxley. A native of East Anglia, the Reverend Purchase moved to Alston Field in 1870 and decided to bring some of the flowers with him from his native Suffolk. Amazingly, 150 years later, this beautiful flower can still be found in the tumbled ruins of the old vicarage orchard. A very rare wildflower with a new home. Thank you, Reverend Purchase. Also in the churchyard is a relative of the Oxley, one that is native to the Peak District and to be found in its thousands in many of the limestone days, the cowslip. Allegedly, the native translation of the name is cow pat. In medieval herbariums, it was noted that they tended to flower where a cow had dropped its waist, though it is remarked that the flowers have a delightful scent of apricot. To round things off, there is also a third and final member of the Primula family at St. Peter's, the false oxlip. Not in fact a hybrid of the cowslip and rare oxlip, but the cowslip and the common primrose. Let us now look at some more spring wildflowers which can be seen across the Peak District. By April, the snowdrops have long gone over, but you could be forgiven for mistaking this plant, the summer snowflake, for one, as it is a member of the family. But look closely and you can instantly see a key difference, the tiny spots at the end of each outer petal. A bizarre looking plant is the toothwort. It lacks chlorophyll and so, being unable to photosynthesize, obtains its nutrients by parasitizing the roots of its host plants. It can be found feeding on a wide variety including hazel, alder, beech and holly. Its common name derives from its flowering stems, which have been said to resemble a row of teeth. An even smaller flower is moss chatter, bearing its five small green flowers atop a short leafless stalk. This unusual appearance has lent to its folkloric name, Town Hall Clock. In the heart of the Peak District is the National Nature Reserve of Lathkildare and two of our more unusual spring flowers grow on its slopes. This 
is the smallest of our forget-me-nots, the early forget-me-not. Its radiant blue flowers never reach more than a few millimetres wide. In the language of flowers, forget-me-not stands for true love and memories, but the plants have only been known by this name since the 19th century. Before then, they were known as scorpion grass. I personally prefer the newer name. Growing with the forget-me-nots is the extremely rare species wall Whitlow grass, now confined to a few of the more pristine limestone dales. In the tall grasses above the river are the serpentine and dramatic flowers of the fritillary. Dark purple and sometimes white, the wildflower is also known as snake's head. Once, thousands filled hay meadows across middle and southern England. However, modern agricultural practices have led to a sharp decline. You cannot see vast swathes in the Peak District, but in special spots you do get glimpses of this elusive flower. When I began walking up Lathkildale on this day in late April, it was beautiful and sunny, but the weather quickly changed and sent a sharp reminder that winter can stay very late in the north. <laughs> Thank you. 